that you would give us um, humility in our hearts to listen and to hear your word, that um, you would allow me as your messenger simply to reflect your truth, that you would be on display, that your truth would be proclaimed and understood and um, believed this morning. And Lord, there may be some here that um, are either on a journey to seek out who you are um, or who have come this morning not really knowing what to expect. Lord, would you help them to truly really understand the gospel of Jesus Christ and how beautiful it is and how powerful it is, as well as, Lord, um, those of us who identify as your children. Lord, help us to grow, to truly understand uh, you as the Messiah, you as the Son of God, how beautiful and majestic you are, and Lord, what a privilege it is to be called um, one of your children, to be part of your family. Help us today, Lord, we ask in your name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Can I ask that the mic just is dialed down just a little bit, because it's a little ringing for me. There you go, it's better. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, all right, good. Um, when I was a child, I used to go to the fair. You guys go to the fair when you're children? And I used to ride the bumper cars. You guys ever ridden bumper cars before? My first time ever in the bumper cars, I was so excited. I got in there because I got to drive, right? And this isn't like driving like when you go down to Disneyland and you're on the whatever that ride is and you have the guardrails there kind of, you know, you're driving, you, you can't only go so far over, you're protected. No, this is, this is like free range driving, right? You can, you can go all over the place as a little kid and it was great, it was fun until something happened and I actually bumped into another car. And because I was as small as I was, when I hit the car, my face went right into the steering wheel. And so I cut my lip all across and after that I was like fearful of the bumper cars. And then um, a little later on in my adult years, I got the courage up again to um, <laughs> get in the bumper cars and um, now I really enjoy it. And if I ever see you in the bumper cars, look, <laughs> look out because um, there are some places where pastor's character is really on display and um, that can be, can be one of them. Now, if you think about it, uh, being a pastor and, and being a Christian um, will mean that uh, it'll be like riding in a bumper car. You'll see where I'm going in just a minute. Because life is full of bumping into others or others bumping into us to kind of challenge us, to kind of oppose us. And the question now is, how should I respond? How should you respond? And one of the options is doing all that I can to avoid being bumped. You know what it's like. It's like, I don't want to be bumped anymore, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go hide off in the corner, just kind of spin around in circles, or I'm just going to stay away from those people that are actually chasing me down. I'm just going to do all I can to get away from them. Um, or I can just like throw a panic attack, and then just, you know, everyone's going to avoid me because they just don't want to, you know, jump into that. Or, or maybe um, I'll just start screaming at others to stay away, and hopefully that will drive them away. Um, uh, the, the secret there is if someone's screaming, it just encourages you more to press the pedal down and to let them know that you're present. Um, or I can get angry and, and, get, you know, and, and mope because people are bumping into me. Another, another option, another consideration though, is I can drive the bumper car knowing that there will inevitably be some bumps along the way. Some bumps are playful. Some bumps are inevitable. Some bumps are intended to harm. Some bumps are intended to show who's in control. And if I'm careful and able, I can even bump others along the way because some bumping actually produces respect. This person isn't just gonna knock down every time I'm, you know, I'm bumping into them. They're actually gonna, they're gonna bump back a little bit. And there's a sense in which in our culture today, they wanna bump and they don't want you to bump back. And they're gonna bump you enough that you're just gonna be quiet. You're gonna go off in the corner. So I'm trying to think through this, this analogy to help us understand 
that we are actually living in a culture that wants to bump us, but if I'm willing to take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, I must also be willing to bump a little bit back. I must be willing to, to stand up for the truth of the gospel, to be heard, to, to, to be a person who is representing the truth of God in a culture that has wandered away from a Judeo-Christian ethic. Now think of this in global terms, and in particular, in the Middle East. Christians are being bumped there all the time. And just over the past few months, in particular in the land of Egypt, there's been a lot of bumping going on. Churches have been burned. Um, People in particular on, I think it was Good Friday, were attacked, killing, uh, no it wasn't Good Friday, it was Palm Sunday. 44 were killed. And if you remember, there was a bus of Christians going to a monastery that was attacked by, uh, by Muslims and they actually went in there and said, if you don't you know, pray the, 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 the prayer to Allah, you know, we're gonna shoot you. There were some survivors that, that told the story of what happened and how they just went through and they shot people and one of the survivors was shot over three times but she was left alive. And, and this is how she responds to this situation. Her name is Shakri. As, as a Christian, she says this, we forgive them. I pray God touches their hearts and changes them so that they see the right path. She was bumped, but she's bumping back a little bit. She's not just cowering, she's saying, you know what, I am praying for them that they will see the light. We're not gonna fold over. From a national perspective, this week you probably heard Bernie Sanders put his foot in his mouth a little bit. Um, basically saying if you hold to the standard historic Christian belief that everyone is condemned apart from faith in Christ, you are not fit to serve in public office. So basically, any Christian and every Christian is disqualified now, based on Bernie Sanders, to serve in public office. Now I wonder if there are Christians who were Bernie fans who knew this about him who are aware of his attitude toward Christianity. But his attitude is kind of an up and rising attitude as an atheist, as someone who doesn't believe in religion. This is the kind of conclusion he's gonna have. But there's a bump going on, friends, and you probably felt a little bit, it's like, where's this coming from? I'm, I'm being bumped, although I'm not the person directly being bumped as a believer. I feel like I've been bumped. In our local context, You may or may not be aware of this, but when we first started Gateway, when we first started meeting here, we got a letter in the mail challenging us to be a welcoming and affirming church, calling us to stand with a long list of local, prominent, and progressive churches who are truly committed to loving and caring about people, rather than promoting the message of hate that would not affirm the LGBTQ ideology and agenda. And friends, of course, that was simply a power move attempting to bully us into conformity. It was a bump. We're not surprised by that. I mean, we're living in the Bay Area. What do you expect? All right, there's gonna be pressure, but there's bumping going on all the time. Now, of course, any truly biblical church that seeks to honor both God and his revealed word seeks to love all people and love them regardless of their sinful struggles. All sorts of people are in bondage to all sorts of sin, but scripture compels us as followers of Christ to guard the truth, to lovingly speak the truth, to be graciously honest about what the scriptures actually teach and God expects and requires, and to present the whole gospel as the only solution for man's ultimate need. We may be bumped, but we need to bump back with the truth of the gospel. We just don't cower. We stand, we affirm, we embrace, and we we love. Now as we turn to Mark's gospel, in our text today, we're gonna see the gospel message is always on a collision course with man-made religion. So far we've seen two collisions take place. There is the healing of the paralytic where Jesus forgives his sin and heals him 
but the collision begins there with the Pharisees. Jesus bumps into them for the first time, and then when he calls Levi and he's gathering with Levi, the other tax collectors and sinners, again, the scribes of the Pharisees are offended that he would associate with that kind of people, and yet this is a bump that Jesus is experiencing by this religious uh, leadership of that day. But here in our text, as the story continues, the collision begins with a question. And here's the question. Why are Jesus and his followers not fasting like the rest of us? And Mark then is going to alert us to the fact that the gospel that Jesus is preaching and the kingdom that he is establishing is in direct opposition to man-made religion. My friends, that, that's, that's the point of this passage. Man-made religion and the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom that he is coming to establish do not work together. They are diametri- diametrically opposed to one another. You don't just add a little bit of the gospel and add a little bit of the kingdom and, and add a little bit of man made religion and somehow come out with the truth. That is the distortion. But that often, friends, is the way that man likes to think. That's the kind of religion that man likes to have. And so, We must remember that the kingdom that Jesus is bringing in and the gospel of God that he comes preaching is on and was on a collision course with the man-made religion of the day. And of course, he's speaking there not to Old Testament Judaism, but he's speaking in particular to the perverted and distorted Judaism of the Pharisees of the day who had added all sorts of laws and regulations as a hedge to protect the law, but as a result, their hedge regulations became their law. In our day, it comes in many different forms. It comes in political forms like liberalism or libertarianism or even conservatism or things like LGBTQ or environmentalism or abortion rights or education or psychology or philosophy and the the list goes on. All of those things, you might say, those are not religions, those are ideologies. But hear this, scripture would argue differently. Scripture would say that anytime you take Jesus off the throne or take God off the throne and put something else on the throne, that now becomes a religion because you have now an ideology, a belief system, you have followers of that ideology, and you have worship services that come in the form of of rallies, of of conferences, of of advertisement, of, of proselytizing through advertisement. It's a religious system. It is not God's system. It is not The gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God is a man-made religion that replaces God's kingdom and his gospel. So as we come to our text today, Jesus will be asked a question and he is going to answer that question. So let's first of all consider the question that is asked. Verse 18, now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting and people came and said to him, why, why do John's disciples and Jesus, the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but, but your disciples don't fast? Bump. See, John's disciples and the Pharisees here are, are, are together in this. They're not necessarily colluding together, they're just, their behavior is similar. Matthew records the disciples of John asking the question but it is interesting to me that they're both in league with each other on this issue. Now why are they coming together? Is it because they identify on the same level together or is there something else going on here? I think they're coming together but they have different reasons for their concerns. Now why is it that the Pharisees would be asking a question like this? Now, there's people that are asking the question here, but but why would this be an issue for the Pharisees? See, in the Old Testament, 
there actually is only one required fast. It's the fast on the Day of Atonement. But rabbinical teaching through the years had added to that command and instituted a voluntary fast on Monday and Thursday of each week. That's why in Luke's gospel, in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, we find the Pharisee saying this, God, I thank you I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. This fasting twice a week comes not from the law, comes not from the scriptures, but comes from the rabbinical teachings. But this fasting twice a week now had become a badge of honor, a badge of spirituality, and a measure of one's merit before God. You see what's happening here? There's God's truth, and then God's truth is added to by man's thinking, and man's thinking then becomes the focus that eclipses God's truth. It becomes the standard, it becomes the measuring stick. And so here, the wrestling match for them is, well how come Jesus' disciples are not fasting twice a week? Well, it's a good question. But you see what's happening here is this. What was voluntary now had become expected. Now, if you think about the disciples of John, and remember that not everything necessarily that is written in the Gospels is chronological, John was likely arrested and in jail. And it's likely that his disciples are fasting, why? Because their leader, their master, is being held captive. And so they're they're mourning, they're fasting, because of that, that's likely what's going on. We're not told specifically, but that, that is likely, if you think about the chronology of things, that's what happened with John. Now, while each group may have differing reasons as to why there should be a fast, what's most important to all of us is what does God command us to do? What does God command us to do? I'm sorry, I should have put those up there. The question is this, does God command a fast? Or had the Pharisees, in their desire to hedge the law, create, they create a monster in insisting on a twice-weekly fast? Had they created an ungodly tradition? Now, I want you to think about this next statement. Anytime we add to God's law and insist on what God has not insisted on, is to seek to outdo God with man-made traditions. God says, this is what I expect of you. This is what I want. Man comes along and says, I know what God says, but now, not only do you have to do what God says, but you have to do what we say. Because what God says is not sufficient. It's not enough. You need to do more. And so Jesus ultimately is going to be confronting that. Now, I've, I've, I've brought up the P word and the T word. The, the P word is the word Pharisee, which is often overused and abused. You need to be careful just to call someone a Pharisee simply because they're, you know, they have a standard that you don't like. Then there's the T word, which is tradition. And tradition has its issues, but understand this, Tradition in and of itself is not a bad thing. We have traditions. We are actually functioning today with some traditions. You know, there's a reason why churches typically across the country met at 11 o'clock. You think, well, why would they meet at 11 o'clock? I mean, shouldn't they meet earlier than 11 o'clock so that when they get out from church, you can go to the restaurant, you can get in line first and all that kind of stuff, right? Now, there's a reason for it. I mean, historically, the tradition of meeting at 11 o'clock came because they were typically out in the country. People had animals. They had, they had animals they had to tend to. They had to clean out the barn. They had to milk the cows. They had to you know, make some breakfast, whatever. Then they had to get cleaned up. Then they actually had to travel to get to church. And so 11 o'clock gave them time to do all of that stuff and get to church and be comfortable. So it's a tradition. Now, if you're looking for the right church and you're saying, I want a church that starts at 11 o'clock, 
That's when churches should start. Then you're functioning based on tradition and you're raising a standard that is nowhere in scripture, okay? So if we start at you know, 1059, it's okay. Now we happen to start at 10 o'clock and we do the unthinkable thing. We actually stop after the singing for 15 minutes and eat a bagel and a donut and coffee? Why? You ever wondered that? We've tried to tell you that because here's my, here just, I'm just telling you this since we're up here and we're talking about it. It's because when people visit a church, oftentimes they'll come like right before it starts and as soon as the pastor says amen, they're out the door. And the only time you get to talk to them is you're chasing them down in the parking lot. That's not the greatest conversation. You have 15 minutes in between you have an opportunity to talk. And not only that, you're able to, to talk with one another as the family of God. I really love this time. It's not, it's not the traditional model. But we're trying to accomplish life in the body and giving 15 minutes to interact with each other makes sense. That's why we do it, okay? It's not based on tradition. Now, in light of the fact that there has already been some controversy between Jesus and the religious leaders, it seems that the question that is asked is not sincere, but somewhat backhanded and supposed to sting. In other words, hey, Jesus, the disciples of John fast, and not only them, but the Pharisees also fast. So what's your problem? Why don't your disciples fast? If you want to be taken seriously... Don't you think that you should follow their example? I mean, this seems to be the culture of the day. If, if you're as godly as you say you are, how come you aren't like the Pharisees or like John's disciples? In our context, the question might come along these lines. Why aren't you a welcoming and affirming church? Or why aren't you giving your time and money to the poor rather than gathering together in churches and all that kind of stuff? Why aren't you joining in celebrating our cultural beliefs and our, our cultural values and, and participating when, when our culture celebrates the life that we want to celebrate? See, these are all pressures. These are all bumps, so to speak, to, to get people to do what they want them to do. Now, the sad reality, friends, is it doesn't always come from outside the context of the church. I've shared this with you before, I believe, but when I was a youth pastor in Buffalo, New York, we got some of this bumping from inside the church. That was the era of Operation Rescue. You guys remember that? That was the abortion, anti-abortion rights advocates, and it all happened in Western New York, and we were in Buffalo, New York, and we had a member in our church that was so gung-ho, and trust me, I'm totally for standing up for, um, you know, for the anti-abortion um, movement. But what he was advocating was that we just cancel church and that we go down and we pick it and we pick it in a place that is illegal to pick it for the purpose of being arrested for the purpose of when we are arrested and we're going through the system to say my name is baby John Doe which is lying so breaking the law lying for the purpose of gathering together in the cells with all the other Christians and singing praises to Jesus. Bump, and if you don't do it, you're not committed to following Christ. Bump, bump, bump. I said, no, I'm committed to following Christ, I'm just not committed to your way of following Christ. And we're not gonna do that. But we're gonna do what we can, we will, we will go, we'll stand, if there's a, a, you know, a demonstration, a peaceful one, and do it in a way that will honor God. That wasn't good enough for him. Got a bump, got a bump, see? And, and friends, this is a challenge for us because it doesn't always just come from the outside. This also comes from the inside. So here's Jesus, and he is getting bumped by those watching and asking the question, how come you don't fast when they fast and they fast? Now notice Jesus' answer. First of all, he's gonna talk about a wedding. Verse 19, and Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. And what he's saying is this, 
that fasting right now, when the bridegroom is present, and by the way, he is the bridegroom in this, anal- this analogy. When the bridegroom is with them, it would be inappropriate to fast. Jesus is using here as this common life example that simply makes sense. Back in that, in that era, in that culture, a wedding would not be something that starts at four o'clock and ends at nine o'clock. A wedding begins on, you know, Saturday and ends the following Friday. And there were celebrations all week long. It was a time for celebration. And the bridegroom would invite his best friends to be his groomsmen, his attendants at the wedding. And so during that week, it would be inappropriate for you to mourn when that celebration was taking place. Now, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 16 gives us a little insight as to the kind of fasting that was going on. Notice what it says, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. And then he follows on and says, truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Their reward is that they get the attention because they're fasting. I don't get the benefit of truly fasting. Now just imagine a mournful wedding. There's a wedding that's gonna take place. There's a wedding gonna be taking place, by the way. I don't know if you know this, but Alexi's getting married in August. Put your hand up. And that's okay, Alexi's getting married, all right? I just want everyone to know that. August 12th, all right? So imagine, imagine we're going to Alexi's wedding, and uh, we're, we're going to the wedding. Imagine I was one of the one of the people that he invited to be a part of his party. I'm not, so don't worry about it, so you don't have to worry about it, all right? But you know, here is this wedding, it begins, and, 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 and the, the, the beautiful auditorium, the location, the, the lights are just right, and the ambience is perfect for it, and out from the back comes the bridegroom, and man, you are dressed to a tee. I mean, you've got a tux on, he looks sharp, man, he is crisp, and everyone's like, wow, man, he is ready for this. And then his best man comes out, and he's looking sharp. Not quite as sharp as you, but he's looking sharp. And, and, and just kind of along the way, all the guys line up. And then the last two, it's me and JD. And we've got tuxedos on, but they're all torn and ripped apart. And our hair is all white. Well, mine almost is. But it's just covered with, it's covered with, you know, with ashes and all that kind of stuff. And our faces are chalky. And we're standing there, and we're just kind of like somber. Now, would that be an appropriate thing at a wedding? And then, you know, the, the, the pastor says, I do. Or no, I, I pronounce you husband and wife, not I do. That would be your job, right? <laughs> and they, they go now to the reception. At the reception, me and JD are off in a corner, and we're just like, you know, knees, uh, kind of on our knees, just kind of huddled down and just kind of in mourning. It would be totally inappropriate. Why? Because a wedding is not a time to mourn. Unless maybe you happen to be someone who wanted to marry him. It's not the, all right. anyway, that's all another thing, right? A wedding is not a time to mourn. A wedding is a time to rejoice. It's a time for feasting. It's not a time for fasting. My friends, that's the picture. That's what Jesus is ultimately seeking to communicate here. Now, all this would be clear to the disciples of John. Take your Bibles and look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And I want you to notice why the disciples would understand what Jesus is talking about. John chapter 3 and verse 28 and following. This is John the Baptist speaking. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is who? The bridegroom, that's Jesus. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, I must decrease. So the disciples of John would have heard John speaking this about his relationship with Jesus. I'm not the bridegroom, he's the bridegroom, I'm the friend of the bridegroom, I am rejoicing. You see how this connects? When Jesus says, hey listen, you don't go and mourn at a wedding. 
when the bridegroom is with you. Now, this also would have made sense to the Pharisees, who had a great grasp of the Old Testament, a sense of their knowledge. Because in the Old Testament, um, God was described many times as a husband. And there certainly was this awareness of him. I'm reading Isaiah 54, 5. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. So Jesus, in using this illustration, is pressing home. He's bumping back, so to speak, that he is more than a miracle worker that he actually is this bridegroom, this husband of the Old Testament, this bridegroom that John the Baptist was talking about. So for the disciples of Jesus, there's no need to fast for they have the groom with them. It's It's a time for continued joy and celebration. It's a time for feasting, not fasting. But notice verse 20. The days will come, he says, when the bridegroom is taken away from them and they will fast in that day. So we're back in Mark here. In other words, a wedding is a time for joy, but there will be a time when the bridegroom is taken away and then you can fast. And friends, this is a veiled description and reference to the cross because the idea of taken away is really wrenched away. It's a, it's a harsh word. It's snatched away violently, and it's actually a word that is used in the Septuagint describing what happens to God's servant, the Messiah, Isaiah 53, verse 8. By oppression and judgment, he was violently taken away in Isaiah 53, and verse 8. There'll be a day for mourning then. There'll be time to fast then. Now, the bridegroom is with you. This is a time for joy. There's no need to fast. So instead, feast on his word. Enjoy his presence. Listen to his counsel. Celebrate his coming. Friends, that is instruction for us. The bridegroom, Jesus Christ, is gone, but he's present with us by means of the Holy Spirit, and we can just think about the fact this is not a time to fast in mourning. This is simply a time to rejoice over the fact that we have this relationship with the bridegroom, who is Christ, who is the Messiah. And so let's do all we can to feast on his word, to enjoy his presence, to listen to his counsel, to celebrate his coming. But the reality is the collision course for Jesus and his disciples was gonna get worse. More confrontation is coming, more plotting and violence in his future. So back again to the big picture here, and that is this. It is inappropriate. It is inappropriate. Not only that, secondly, we're gonna find out it is incompatible. talking here about this relationship of the gospel with this man-made religion. It is, it is inappropriate. Now it is incompatible. And he uses these two illustrations to help us understand that. So first of all, there's the old garment. Verse 21, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. Now, I don't know how many people here actually still sew like this. Um, My form of sewing is Amazon.com, right? Um, That's that's our cultural kind of mindset anymore. It's like, ah, it's done, I'll buy a new one, right? And we were, you know, does anyone know what the word darn means except for it's bad sense, right? I mean, it's proper sense. Darn means to fix socks that have holes in them. When's the last time someone did that? Don't raise your hand. But, you know, people who don't have much, they do those things. But we've grown out of that, right? So it's maybe hard for us to relate to what's going on here, but the idea is you take something that, has, uh, that is new and you, you sew it onto, uh, you sew some, that new patch onto an old garment. When you wash it, that, that new patch is going to tear away um, from that, that old 
garment. So that he's saying basically this, that the new internal gospel is incomplete with the teachings of the Pharisees. That, that gospel might, might attach itself there, they might force it on there, and they might patch it or try and patch it, but the reality of the gospel will finally be seen for what it is that will tear away from that garment. It's so important to note here that Jesus is not saying the teachings of the Old Testament. Jesus doesn't abolish the Old Testament. Verse 17 in Matthew 5 says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to what? Fulfill them. Fulfill them. So Jesus didn't come to, to patch up man's religion, all right? He came to fulfill the Old Testament and to usher in a new message or a new kingdom with a new message and the ultimate king who is Jesus. Now it's interesting that the religions of man like to include Jesus as part of their source of wisdom, at least their selected source of wisdom, right? They'll pick and choose what Jesus says. They, they like to include him because he says a lot of nice things, right? Um, yeah, he does. Um, but it's, it's what you choose to ignore that is the issue. Now, they sense, in a sense, want to patch Christ into their religion. But that'll never do because Christ, when he is seen for who he truly is, and what he really says will rip apart that man-made religion. He'll expose it for its perverseness and for what it really is. And friends, this is what happens when in our pop culture, influential people think they should quote scripture or somehow refer to Christ, but they will be exposed because it'll be clear that what they're saying actually is completely disconnected from what the intent of scripture is all about. You hear that a lot whether it's candidates that are political, whether it's on TV, you know, talk show hosts, things like that. They love to bring up scripture now and then, but it's just like, yeah, but that's not what that text is talking about. But they like to bring it out because they, they, wanna, they wanna include Jesus in one sense. But the problem is the gospel will always reveal something to be man-made rather than God-created. Then there's the old wineskins. Look at verse 22. Verse 22, right? Um, No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is destroyed and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. Now the wineskins of the day were made from the skins of goats. The legs would be tied off, and they would typically have the wine in there. They would pour out from where the neck is. Um, And when new wine is placed in a new wineskin, it gives off these gases, these fermenting gases, and the wineskin expands with that new wine. And so an old wineskin cannot handle the pressure of new wine and its fermentation. It's already expanded. And so what happens when that new wine goes in it will just burst and you lose the wine and you lose the wineskin. That's the image that he's describing here. And so the message of the gospel, ultimately he is saying by this analogy, was this new wine and could not be placed in the old wineskin of the Phar- that the Pharisees had established. In other words, their, their hedges and traditions, it would be incompatible with them and would explode. The only suitable container for new wine is fresh wineskins. So in the same way, the only life that can contain true righteousness is the life or the new life given by God when a person repents of his sin and trusts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So let me just pull all this together. The gospel could neither be added to the perverted laws and traditions of the Pharisees, nor confined within them. Legalism and the good news of God's grace in Christ were never meant to go together. Now, 
question then is what is legalism? And I just want to answer that briefly here in three ways. What is legalism? Number one, it's seeking to be justified before God by our own works, which simply means that God, rather than me simply believing what you say is true and asking you to forgive me, I feel now that I have to do some things that will impress you, that will show you how much I love you, and by doing these things, these works, I will then have then the merit to enter into eternal life with you. That's legalism that is seeking a salvation by works, which is not what scripture teaches. Legalism, secondly, is adding human laws to the actual laws of the Bible. That's what the Pharisees were doing. It's that whole hedge concept. When you're adding some law, some regulation, it's kind of like saying, you know, if you're a guy The Bible says that your hair should never touch your ears. Now, I've seen some of your ears, okay? The the point here is you, you, you add a standard to identify what true Christianity should look like, and now that standard becomes the measuring stick rather than the truth of God's word. And, and Christians have been doing that for years adding things to what Scripture says. They may be well-intended, but they ultimately end up being the focus and the measuring stick of what spirituality looks like. And you may have been caught up in that milieu. I know I was. In the context in which I grew up as a Christian, there was a lot of that kind of stuff going on, right? The third third way that you play out legalism, it's seeking to pursue our sanctification, which simply means our growth toward Christ-likeness in a way that is excessively reliant on our human effort and forgetful of God's grace. Let me explain that. Only true believers will read the Bible in a year. And if you want to be a true, godly, mature believer, you're gonna read at least four chapters a day. And so you say, okay, I'm gonna read four chapters a day, which by the way is a good thing to do. I'm gonna get through the Bible, there's some good programs out there, right? But what happens if you end up forgetting to read it one day? Oh, what's gonna happen now? You see, and and, and the reality of life is, yeah, we need to be disciplined in our Christian walk, but the reality is that that God is gracious, that even even in our desire for good things and to pursue good things, we are going to sin and we're going to fail, we're going to fall short. God promises that we're still in his grace and surrounded by his love in the midst of it. That doesn't mean we just brush it aside and say, well, no big deal, forget about it, you know, it's not. No, you still want to pursue it. You still want to move on. You still want to grow but you allow the grace of God to come and to say, you know what, I'm just, I'm gonna step up and I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep at this thing because it's an issue of discipline, but, but don't, don't allow it to be a measure of your spirituality in the sense of, you know, you're far more mature if you read four chapters, you know. How many five chapter people do we have here? Good, all right, you guys, you guys get to the line first, right? But that's the kind of stuff, that's, these are the things that go on in our heads. I'm not a good Christian because I didn't, didn't finish out you know, checking off all the boxes this week. Friends, that is legalism, and, and there's, 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 there's kind of a, an elasticity to number three here, seeking to pursue our sanctification in a way that is excessively reliant on our human effort. Uh, this, this, for you, could, could be in a number of different ways, but it is forgetful of God's grace. You are saved by grace and grace alone. But you are called to pursue Christ. But in that pursuit, you're gonna hit, can you imagine you're in a canoe, you're gonna hit some, some sandbars along the way. Some of you might be in a sandbar right now. And you need some help to get pushed off there. Your Christian walk is like that. There are going to be struggles. There are going to be trials. There's going to be obstacles. There's going to be things that, that hinder your walk. And you're going to say, oh, I haven't been in church for a long time. I've got to get back to church. I've got to, got to start this again. That's all very typical of the Christian walk. So you say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to effort. I'm going to, I'm going to use my, 
my heart and my, my, my thinking and, and my will and my desires to, to get back to where God wants me to be, but I'm also going to bask in the grace of God that secures me as one of his children. Both work together. And we've got we've to really work hard at what the balance is of that. Okay? Now, what's interesting is that all of these are in play here with the Pharisees. You have the seeking to be justified before God by good works. You know, look at what I've done. I fast twice a day or twice a week, right? Or adding human laws, which they did plenty of, and then seeking to pursue sanctification in a way that's excessively reliant on human effort and forgetfulness of God's grace. Now, friends, there's some, there's some things I, wanna, I just want to tease out as we bring this to a close. This is not my concluding thoughts. This is just kind of building off of what you looked here with this, this, these um, old wineskins and the, it's this patch of new cloth. We must be careful of simple reductions of biblical truth that say things like, hey, the Old Testament, it's all about law. Or I should say, the Old Testament, it's all about law. But the New Testament, it's all about grace. Now, friends, that is, that is a reductionism that betrays the teaching of Scripture. And, and if we have that kind of article, it can leave people and push people or bump people to be cynical about the Old Testament. In other words, we're reading the Bible, and it's like you see something, and you say, oh, that's just the Old Testament. I'm a New Testament Christian. No, you're not a New Testament Christian in that sense. You are a Bible Christian because the Old Testament works with the New Testament. The New Testament reflects back to the Old Testament. You don't have ultimately one without the other. The New Testament completes the Old Testament. So the people in the Old Testament were not a people in bondage to the law as if they were living in a dark and bitter climate because God was an ogre who wanted to rain on their parade and throw down rules and regulations. I mean, that's how our culture today would look back at the Old Testament. What an ogre God he is. That's not, a, uh, that's not an accurate picture of God in the Old Testament. We have a tendency to think that because we love doing exactly what we please. We don't like rules and regulations put on us. We like a gospel that says, God loves you, you're forgiven now, live like you please. That's the kind of gospel that we like. But that is not the gospel. It is God loves you and you're forgiven. But the next part is, and you have a new master that you are enslaved to, and his name is Jesus. Now, he's a good master. It's completely different, isn't it? You see, in the Old Testament, it is full of people who loved God and loved his law. Just read Psalm 119 if you don't believe me. We're not gonna read the whole thing this morning, but just in case you don't believe me, I'll read a few verses here, verses 14 through 16. It says this, in the way of your testimonies, or that's the idea of his law, I delight, he says, as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts, again referring to the law, and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. That doesn't sound like a, an Old Testament character who thought that God was an ogre and oppressive sounds like an Old Testament character who delighted in the law. In fact, the beginning of the, the Psalms, Psalm 1, in referencing the, the blessed man and setting the tone for the whole of the book of the Psalms, it says this in verse 2, blessed, or uh, this is the blessed man, but his delight is where? It's in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night, and he's like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and all he does, he prospers. So there's this understanding that the law and, and loving the law and being obedient to the law resulted in prosperity, the kind of prosperity that was life-giving. That doesn't sound like people who thought that the Old Testament God was an ogre. So we must be careful that we don't allow any teaching that seeks to drive a wedge between the law of God 
and the grace of God. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, and we must remember that the law is a tutor to get us to Christ. Now, you may not like the law in the sense that the law reveals your heart, but as a Christian, you should be thankful for the law that it does reveal your heart and shows you how wonderful and beautiful the gospel of Jesus Christ actually is. Now, the other thing to remember is this. There's certainly, in the, with the coming of Christ and the establishing of this new kingdom and, and this gospel of, of God message that he is bringing, there is this new administration. The, the organization, the administration of the Old Testament is gonna be, um, I try to be careful how I say this here, is, is going to be uh, replaced or it's going to give birth to this new administration. So the gospel of God that, that Jesus brings in this new wine, this new patch, uh, uh, comes and the forms of the old, the forms and the structures of the Old Testament would give birth and be replaced uh, by the forms and the structures of the, the good, uh, this God's new creation, which is the church of God. And so we, we look at things a little differently through the lens of the church and through the lens of Israel. That's just the point there. But grace, hear this, has been flowing since the beginning of creation. Grace didn't just show up with Christ. See, I'm just, I'm just trying to drive home the fact, this idea, New Testament's grace, Old Testament's law. Certainly you're gonna have a lot of law in the Old Testament, but just pick up the book of Revelation, you might see some wrath going on there too. But grace has been there ever since, the beginning, all the way to the end. Now, what Jesus is referring to is not the law. What Jesus is referring to is, is the teaching of the Pharisees who perverted and twisted the law to be a system of legalism. So you cannot, you cannot patch that system up with the gospel because the gospel is incompatible with it. It will rip it and tear away from that system. You cannot put the gospel into that perverted and legalistic system because once again, it is incompatible and it will fight against that system and point to the point that it ultimately explodes. So what Jesus is doing here is going for the jugular of man-made religion of the Pharisees of that day, and Jesus is confronting the Pharisees for their distortion of the law and showing that what is really needed what has, is what has come, and that is the, the new patch, this new wine. There's a, a new kingdom, a new king, and a new, fresh outworking of the gospel of God that he is preaching. Now, since Jesus was ushering in the promised fulfillment of the Old Testament law, there's no need to go back to it. But isn't it interesting that even as the church begins and as the disciples begin to actually spread the gospel, that even they are still struggling with this reality, that they revert back to old Judaism. And there have to be some, some squabbles among them to sort this out because it's so easy for us to slip back into forms that we know, legalistic thinking. It's so natural for us to do that but we need to be reminded that that is not what God has called us to. Now, having said all of that, let's now consider four concluding thoughts. Four concluding thoughts. Number one, this might come as a shock to you if you're a full-blooded American, okay? Number one, the majority isn't always right. Now friends, that is, that is a, a principle throughout scripture. The majority isn't always right. Democracy is not a biblical concept or paradigm to follow. More often than not, when you have the majority, it results in loss. Just think about when Israel came to the brink of the promised land. Twelve spies were sent out to Canaan. And God had promised them the land. He had spoken but the majority came back and said, we can't go in there, the giants are living there, there's no way we're gonna manage this, there's absolutely no way we could do it. And you had two guys that said, hey listen, God said we need to do it, so we're gonna do it. 
oh no, we can't do it. Majority spoke. And they suffered. 40 years, wandering, struggle. But majority had spoken. But there are two guys that said, no, we need to believe what God said. What scripture does teach is that God is always to be honored by all, especially those who are in leadership. However, in life, sometimes the ranks of man-made religion will seek to pressure us. But remember this. My pastor used to say this years ago. God and I always make a majority. You're at work and you have co-workers that start to turn on you because you're a Christian, and it seems like, oh, there's like 10 of them, and they're just like always laughing at me or always mocking me, and it's not because you're walking in with this big Bible under your arm, it's just because you said some things in conversation, like, how could you believe that? Just remember that you and God make a majority. He's far bigger than they are. You stand with him, and he stands with you. So don't let religious people pressure you into giving up or abandoning or compromising your convictions. Allow God to fashion and shape all that and stand with what he says. Secondly, the gospel is incomplete or say incompatible with man-made religion. And I know we've touched on this, but let's think about this again. Man-made religion cannot be patched up The pluralism of our day wants us all to conform to the beat of the drum of unity. Let's all come together and coexist, just like the bumper sticker says. In other words, there's a stress to say that we can take the good from all religions and combine them and seek to work together for the good of mankind. And it sounds so good, it sounds so noble, even religious. But it's headed on a collision course with the gospel because the gospel doesn't team up with man-made religion. There's only one Jesus. There's only one gospel. There's only one salvation. And that exclusivity is hated by all man-made religion. And we need to understand that. We need to recognize that, that that's part of the reason that people want to bump up against us because they do not like the exclusivity of the gospel. Now certainly we're called as a church to coexist with other religions. In other words, we're not, we're not out to kind of, you know, uh, do nasty things to other people of other religions. That's not the point. We're, 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 gonna, we're gonna coexist, we're gonna live peaceably with all men. That's what scripture says. Do all you can to live at peace with others. And we must not be guilty of trying to coerce conversions. Friends, that would violate scripture. We don't go around and pull someone's arm and say, you better believe in Jesus Christ, or I'm gonna, you know. That's not how you do it. Now, I will say, but part of the history of the world, you had that. People landed in South America, and they went to you know, tribes and peoples, and they said, listen, you either convert or, that is not evangelism. All right? That is coercion, that is abuse of the highest kind. That does not stand well with God, and those people will answer for their actions. But we are commanded to compel people to come to Christ. That means we can speak with passion, we can speak with with, with belief, we can speak with joy, and we can speak with certainty and confidence that it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that is what is needed here. But our culture boasts and preaches a message of tolerance. Now, on one level, we do need tolerance. As I've mentioned in Romans 12, 18, if it's possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. But the message of tolerance from our culture is in a head-on collision with the gospel because the gospel isn't tolerant. The gospel doesn't set aside portions of its message for the sake of tolerance. The gospel says, 
We're all sinners. The gospel says, because you're all sinners, you are condemned. The gospel says, there's a solution. The gospel says the solution comes down from God, the Godhead, in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. The gospel says he went to a cross, he died on that cross for your sin. And the gospel says you must believe and repent in that sacrifice for there to be forgiveness and for you to not be numbered among those people who are condemned. It's just the gospel. It's just not something we throw around just to make people feel happy. It is what it is. And we either believe it or we don't believe it. And as soon as we try and change it, it no longer is the gospel. So the gospel by its very nature is intolerant. It is incompatible with sin. And sin ultimately must be dealt with. So the majority isn't always right. The gospel is incompatible with man-made religion. Here's the third one. Embracing the gospel means radical whole life change. Hear this. Embracing Christ or becoming a Christian isn't simply adding Jesus to your already filled life. You don't simply patch Jesus in. Embracing Christ isn't just rearranging your desires and your wishes so that somehow you can make room for Jesus. Jesus doesn't want you to make room for him. It's like, come on, come over to my house, Jesus. I got a nice room. It's off in the back here next to the washer and dryer in the corner here. I got some room here for you. That's not how it works. The gospel means a radical whole life change. We don't add Jesus to our lives. We don't make room for him to dwell in our hearts. What we do is we abandon everything for the sake of Christ. Nothing in my hands I bring, song says, simply to the cross I cling. When I embrace Christ, I am coming saying, everything is yours. You are my master, you are my savior, you are changing me from the inside out. All of me, all my thoughts, all my desires, all my, all my behaviors, all my, th- all my activities, they're all now under your direction and will. It's a whole life radical change. We don't add him and we don't find room for him. He is the room in our life. Now friends, that might be a shocking statement for the American church today. Who likes to say, well, you know, I got Jesus now. Let me find if I can get something else. So it's kind of like, you know, the, the people that have the, you know, the suitcases and they got patches for, or, or stickers wherever they go. See, I got my Jesus sticker there. I'm in. Uh, I got my Mormon sticker here, I guess I'm in. And you try to get as many stickers and hopefully, you know, that'll get you through. It doesn't work that way. Jesus wants you and he wants all of you and he exclusively wants to be your master. There's only one way that can work. Number four. The bride of Christ is not called to mourn. That's us, believers. We're not called to mourn, but to be pure and ready with joyful anticipation of the groom's return. That doesn't mean that we don't fast. There's a place for fasting in the life of a believer. But our posturing is to be pure, seeking to be holy, to be ready, and joyfully anticipating his return. Are you ready for the bride to be reunited with the groom? Are you pure, clothed in Christ's righteousness and pursuing holiness like the scriptures say? Are you looking for his coming with joyful anticipation? And maybe the question would be, when he comes, how will the bridegroom find his bride? 
Lord, we have a lot of things to think about this morning. We are living in a context and a culture where we are, as believers, being bumped in so many ways to be quiet, to be removed from places of influence, places of authority and responsibility. We're being bumped in such a way as to be marginalized or to be mocked for what we believe. And yet, Lord, as Christians, we know what it is that you have called us to. We know that the end of the story ends with you seated on your throne, high and lifted up, and the world bowing down, either because they've delighted in you as their savior or because they have come to recognize that you are Lord of all the earth. Lord, help us to live in light of the reality of your return. And not seek to, and not settle for for somehow a, a patchy form of Christianity where we simply want to add Jesus a little bit here and there, but Lord, that you would have all of us. That your gospel would be in us and would be fermenting in such a way that we would be growing and, and, and stirred up with the gifts of the Spirit for the glory of God and for the furthering of your kingdom. You are our great God and Savior. You are master. Shape us, fashion us according to your will. And Lord, if there's any spirit of legalism in us that's either been caught once again because we've been saved or maybe we're struggling with it now thinking that we have come to faith in Christ, Lord, would you give us clarity through your word by your Holy Spirit to see what is true to humble ourselves before you and to confess our sin and come running to you, basking in your grace, recognizing our condition that has been paid for by your son, Jesus Christ. Once again, Lord, we praise you for who you are. In your precious name, amen.